Hello, everybody. So, today I want to talk about 13 undervalued growth stocks that are in my coverage universe that got even cheaper as of this morning because we're in the fourth day of a mini crash, an August crash. August is, is usually a bad month for stocks, but today for, I mean, for growth stocks, this, this August has been really bad, actually. Um, which, which is surprising because these stocks, uh, in my view, uh, have a bright future ahead of them and they're just at the beginning of their adoption curve. Um, but it's an opportunity. If you have cash to deploy, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity. If you have stocks that haven't dropped much, it's an, it's an opportunity to, to maybe swap, um, some old positions that you don't want anymore for, for more, uh, more explosive growth type of stocks, not investment advice, of course. It's just what I'm doing right now. And, um, let me get started and tell you about these stocks. Tell you about these 13 undervalued stocks. So, as you know, on my channel, I don't focus on the same metrics as everyone else, right? I don't really focus on, on PE or price to cash flow or anything like that because I'm not a value investor. I'm a growth investor. I invest in the adoption of products. I, I invest in, in products that are only early on and that are only beginning their S-curve of adoption products and services. And because of that, I use my own little metric that I created here, which is enterprise value over gross profits, trailing 12 month gross profits, over revenue growth. Um, and, and this, this question, this, this metric here answers the question, how much am I paying for each percentage point of growth? What's the cost of each per percentage point of forward growth? How much am I paying? For that, and I consider a score under 0.5 to be excellent. This is a spin on the peg ratio. Now, you may remember the peg ratio is under 1. Under 1 is considered excellent. Here's the thing, though. The peg ratio is for earnings, not for gross profit. I'm looking at the gross profit, and of course, gross profits come in earlier on the income statement uh, than your net income. And as a result of that, I have to be more stringent and want a ratio that's lower than the peg ratio. So to be excellent for me, it has to be under a 0.5. But you'll see that's not going to be a problem because lots of stocks are way below a 0.5. Like those are those top three on, in my spreadsheet will be open fine. Quickly, last few things, um, right? Price is often used, market cap. People often use price or market cap, same thing, right? Um, but, uh, me, I don't, I don't use market cap. I don't use price. I use enterprise value. Uh, if you're new to the channel, do not be worried about enterprise value. Enterprise value is, 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 is very similar to market cap, except that if a company has a lot of debt and not a lot of net, so not a lot of cash, like not a lot of net, net cash position, because we have more debt than cash, then that company will be penalized in the assessment. So enterprise value simply uh, penalizes companies that have a lot of debts by making them look much more expensive. Um, and it's it's good. It's helpful because because you know some some stocks, for example, if you were to take enterprise value, you take any any, any stock in the auto sector like a Ford. Enterprise value is like three and a half to four times as much as market cap. So market cap, you're like, oh, it's only a fifty billion dollar company, it looks cheap. And then you look at EV and you realize, oh wait. It's close to 200 billion. It's not that cheap, is it? Um, that's because it, it takes out debt because a lot of companies do, do issues with their debt. Like they engage in revenue financing, which is very dangerous. That's how, um, for example, GE went, went almost, almost bust because they did too much revenue financing. Anyways, um, I ramble here. So I use that. So I use EV. I use growth profit instead of earnings because all these companies are too early for earnings. They're not optimized for earnings and their CEOs should not want to show earnings right now. They should want to reinvest in the business. They should not want to, to have earnings. And then I use revenue growth instead of uh, of earnings growth. And the reason why I use revenue growth and not even gross profit growth is that you'll find that over the years, I mean, gross profit is typically pretty, pretty stable, especially the higher it is, the more the gross profit is going to be stable. And as a result of that, I use uh, revenue growth as a proxy for, 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 um, uh, gross profit growth. Um, it's, uh, re revenue growth is an easy metric to find. So anyways, not a perfect measure. No measure is, um, but, but still helpful in my view. And it is this metric that I use to tell you which stock is undervalued right now. And the winner of the week, the most undervalued growth stock this week is Himson. 
Hims went back into the most undervalued uh, territory. And, you know, I often joke, between Hims and Stone Co., it's a fight. You know, some month is going to be Stone Co., some month is going to be Hims. Recently, Hims has been winning because Hims has dropped, uh, was it 40% from its high or something like that? So that's the reason why it's been winning. Um, Hims is a company I do not understand how cheap it is. It's trading at two times, uh, two times sales, right? And the price value is only two times sales, uh, two times gross profit. Okay, there's, there's, a, there's a surrounding here. Up here. Um, but anyway, it's a very, very, very cheap stock. Hims is, is a healthcare uh, company, healthcare 2.0, uh, as opposed to the traditional sick care. And I, I cover Hims uh, a lot on the channel. In a nutshell, what does Hims do? It is an e-doctor and an e-pharmacy all together, all at once, in one easy monthly payment. If you get prescribed, if you get a treatment, if you're not prescribed any treatment, you don't even have, you don't you don't even have to pay, or you pay something very nominal. Um, and it's much easier than the traditional health system. Much easier to use. Focuses on a lot of on a lot of preventative healthcare issues. Anyways, I've covered him in hims in great depth uh, on this channel, so I'm not going to spend too much time on hims. Uh, moving on to Stone Cold. So what is Stoneco? Stoneco is the square of Brazil. That's how I call Stoneco. It's the square of Brazil. Um, almost 3 million uh, small businesses use uh, the Stoneco payment terminal. Uh, they are still growing uh, the, new, the number of new customers at a very high clip, about 30% new customers each year. Revenue growth is growing at 40%. So not only are they, are they growing how many uh, small businesses are using the payment terminal, but they are also oh, using those terminals more. Those businesses are using the terminal terminal more as Brazil is going through, through, through this transition away from cash. So Brazil is a very interesting country. Central Bank is pushing for PIX, which is a, which is a, which is a the central bank payment system, kind of your CBDC, if you will. Uh, and they want the Brazilians to use PIX and not use cash. And of course, that benefits a company like Stoneco, who has a little terminal payment, and they get the fees. Um, the average take rate on the transactions for, for Stoneco is, is, uh, is close to 2.5% uh, of each transaction is what they take. And so this is a business that's also heavily linked on the economy, just like a Visa or a MasterCard. The more people spend, the more it's going to be reflected in, in the revenues of Stone Co. And we know that Brazil just started dropping interest rates by half a, half a point. They dropped interest rates, right? Lula, is, is the new president of Brazil, is doing its best to push interest rates down. What happens when you when you drop interest rates? The economy takes off, and this should benefit Stoneco. I cannot understand why Stoneco is this cheap. Um, the market is giving it absolutely no credit for future growth. The third cheapest stock out here is Lovesack. Lovesack is an interesting play. Uh, it's a maker of uh, modern furniture. They essentially make bean bag and adjustable recliners, uh, not recliners, uh, um, uh, comforters and, 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 and sofas. Um, so they make uh, sectional, sectionals, or they, they make they make reconfigurable sectionals, and they also uh, make bean bags. Anyways. Doesn't really matter what they do. What matters is uh, uh, the, the stock, I believe. I mean, the company is decent, right? I'm not very passionate about furniture. They sell furniture. But the company is, is decent. It's modern furniture. The point, though, is the valuation. The valuation out here is, is just insane because they are trading. Um, actually, actually, it's, see, I should have really not rounded this. They're, they're trading lower uh, than their sales, right? Look at their sales. Revenue is, is $663 uh, million. And they are trading at uh, 469 million. So this is a company that's trading at 0.8x sales. It's a company that's growing sales. They're still growing sales at, at a 22% clip. The gross margin is 53%, which is very good for this type of retail. Very, very good. And so it ends up being being the cheapest, cheapest, uh, the third cheapest stock in my universe. I, I don't understand how, how cheap this is, why this could be cheap. By the way, none of these companies are, are on the verge of bankruptcy. Like you would think, oh, they're on the verge of bankruptcy. No, 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 no. They're, they're, they're all uh, either cash flow positive, either cash flow negative, but it's just negative a few million bucks, such that they have enough cash uh, to uh, to cushion uh, any blow. So it's it's his companies are not on the verge of bank, and they're trading at this 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 crazy low valuation. I don't I don't understand it. Remember, I consider something under a point five. I consider to be excellent. I mean, this, these these three stocks are ten times cheaper than what I consider to be an excellent valuation. 
absolutely insane. And of course, uh, the, the story of, of Love Sack is is the, the market right now looks at looks at interest rates. Interest rates are high, and they're saying, well, people are never going to buy furniture again ever. That's that's kind of what the market is saying uh, uh, right now, which is which is absolutely not true. Obviously, family formation is still happening. Um, you know, couples still meet and move in together, and they buy furniture. That's the story of the world. It's always been like that. It will always be like that. But the market does not think like that. The market is like let's sell furniture stocks. You know, no people, new households are never going to want new furniture. Anyways, um, I do not understand how cheap this stock is. This is a this is a very very unique uh, pricing here. Moving on to New Bank, and I'll cover both both New Bank and SoFi. Kind of at the same time, both of these companies are dirt cheap. They are neo banks. What is a neo bank? It's a bank that has no branches. Because they have no branches, they're able to offer the best interest rates, the best products, the best service. They are digitally native uh, companies that have a digitally native app. Right? The app is just. The, the app is not a translation of legacy systems into a, a bulky. Uh, poorly written piece of code on your phone, right? Which is oftentimes what a legacy bank's app is going to look like. This is not the case for a new bank. This is not the case for SoFi. They are very, very modern banks in your phone. It's the bank in your phone. Uh, and because of that, they're growing at a very, very uh, high pace. Now, new bank is growing faster than SoFi. Why? Because new bank is focusing on Latin America. And Latin America has a very large population of unbanked so people who go straight from cash and handling you know cash proverbially under the mattress to actually having a a, a financial services company a bank for the first time and actually if you look at the new bank the net promoter score of new bank is through the roof because people are very very excited that they now have access to financial services but they didn't they didn't even need to have access to also new bank has a very very cheap customer acquisition cost still under 10 bucks customer acquisition cost granted it's a um, it's it's a it's a it's it's a customer that, that doesn't have an average income of so far and you have to take that into account but even if you take that into account uh it's still 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 dirt cheap and so far is, 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 a, is a is a similar story except so far as a I, w I would argue, and, and you know, I know, I know a lot of people love love SoFi, so I don't want to, I don't want to criticize it too much. But I, I, I would argue they, they, they have a little, just a tad more headwinds. One of them is the student loans. We'll see what happens with the student loans. I, I've, I've said that many times on the channel. Another, another headwind that I see for SoFi is, of course, uh, the customer acquisition costs are higher in the U.S. because you're going after consumers that are already banked somewhere, and it's convenient for them to stay somewhere else. So SoFi has to offer an extra, extra good product slash service in order to compel people to switch. That's why a lot of the growth of SoFi comes uh, from actually uh, people who are entering the job market, you know, people who are just getting out of school, who don't really have a bank or don't really have a strong banking relationship yet with a bank. That's who they're going after. They're going after the affluent millennial. They've been doing very well because of, of that. I own both companies. I like both companies right now, like New Bank a little better, and New Bank is a little cheaper per my metric. But SoFi, SoFi is a great company as well. Moving on to Indie, Indie Semiconductors. So Indie Semiconductors is a stock that keeps, keeps, keeps uh, being so so cheap. And uh, actually, if you if you compare it in the, in the semi sector, even when I look at a company like AMD, which is a company that I used to think is like kind of middle of the road as far as valuation, Nvidia valuation is way through the roof. I, I, I even for even for my blood and people tell me all of my stocks are all overvalued. Even for me, Nvidia is overvalued, which is which is like I, and typically I'm very lenient. So Nvidia I've sold. Um, AMD I think is is is, is becoming very very expensive as well but a, a, a semiconductor that's cheap is indie semiconductor indie semiconductor is very cheap and it's still growing very fast almost doubling revenues over the next 12 months it's predicted to almost double revenues a gross margin is 44 percent in a nutshell what does indie do indie was founded by a, a semiconductor industry veterans and what they do is they do ADAS system and they do uh, driver assist systems uh, for OEM uh, cars, for OEM manufacturers um, of cars, if that makes any sense. So the legacy players in the car business, they want to have the electronic features of the Tesla. And they are going to be buying uh, semis for that. And, and Indy is trying to be one of the players that sells 
Semis um, uh, to those uh, original uh, manufacturers of cars, you know the the, the, the legacy companies. So so they're ca catering to the legacy companies, which which adds a lot of risk, right? Because you have to bet on how many uh, legacy auto companies are going to survive Tesla. That's kind of a bet that you have to make. And if you follow Tesla, <laughs> you know you know it's a it's a, it, it may be less than most uh, pundits think. It may be there may be less legacy traditional auto companies that survive than most people think and you know we're entering a very interesting uh point with the strikes that are that are coming up in the auto sector in the u.s it's just going to be very interesting to see what happens anyways let me move on to stem what is stem stem is an installer of mega packs uh, they are actually mostly uh, i mean more than 50 percent of what they install is uh, the tesla mega packs so stem is very is a very interesting company they install mega packs um they do they do uh, let's call it about half Half Tesla, half Chinese mega packs, and they install mega packs both for industrial buildings and for utilities. Uh, and of course, mega packs are, are the future of energy storage. Um, in my view, right, as we as we move to uh, more intermittent sources of energy, like sun, for example, you need as a company you need to be able to store uh, the, the extra energy from from your roof, from your sun roof, uh, for the night. You need, you need to be able to store it, and that's what Sten does. They install this and sell it. And you also need uh, those. Um, you, you're also going to need those mega packs at, at industrial facilities across the U.S. as we move to electric trucks to electric semi trucks because you bet you bet companies are going to move to electric semi trucks because don't forget they are much 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 cheaper to operate so they're going to move to electric semi trucks because you're reducing you know a, a tank of of gas of a semi truck for a regular company is is what between between 1200 and eh, probably between a thousand and twelve hundred dollars worth of diesel for a for a semi truck, so 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 you're going to be cutting that cost by more than ten when you move to electric. It's going to be about a hundred bucks of electricity. Um, but in order to do that that move, you need to be able to have those megawatt chargers. Those megawatt chargers are absolutely essential because of, because otherwise, uh, charging an electric truck, even with a very powerful charger of today, charging an electric semi truck, well well that would take you know ten hours. Otherwise, even with a great charger of today, so you need to have the megawatt chargers. The megawatt chargers are likely going to charge a semi truck um, in about a minute. In about a minute with a mega charger, uh, and, and you know this is this is this is another uh, 10x improvement, by the way, for this technology. This is why this technology is going to win. Because if you look at the average semi truck, the average semi truck uh, um, fuels itself in about 15 minutes. It takes about 15 minutes to fuel the average semi truck. It's going to take about a minute with a mega charger. But to have those mega chargers to charge those semi trucks. You need battery packs because the the grid does not deliver one megawatt in most spaces. Like most most industrial buildings do not have one megawatt delivered by the, the grid, which is why you need you need a you need a giant battery pack that accumulates energy, charges itself, and then unloads itself in a minute in a truck, and then the truck can charge in a minute. So this is essential for the semi-truck revolution. This is essential for the energy independence revolution. Th this product is at the core of a revolution. So so that's kind of why I like this company very, very much. What I don't like about this company, STEM, is the gross margin. But you can see it's still dirt cheap despite 20% gross margin. I don't like the gross margin because right now what they're doing is, they, is they're, they're mostly installing those mega packs. So they are mostly a, a designer, consulting, engineering firm uh, but eventually this gross margin will grow because whenever they sell a mega pack they sell it with a 20-year contract and this contract um, of course as we go through a year this contract should be reflected much 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 more greatly in the gross margin such that this is a company i think over the next 10 years we're going to see an evolution in the gross margin to a point where you know probably in in, in the mid 2020s you will have more revenue from software than you have from hardware. So this this number is a little skewed um, because of the hardware sales. Anyways, it's a complicated stock to analyze. I will I will I will give you that. I mean, if you if you own this stock, you know it's a complicated story. Uh, but nonetheless, very very interesting story in my view and cheap, dirt cheap. What's the next one? Figs. 
So Fix is still extremely cheap. The, the stock has not recovered, um, you know, and, and, and Fix is projected to still sell at 13%. What is Fix in a nutshell? Fix is, um, you know, some some people have called it the next Lululemon. We'll see. We'll see if they succeed. But Figs is trying to popularize scrubs. They are trying to make scrubs, so the traditional healthcare uh, clothing, fashionable and, and hip. That's what they are trying to do. That's what Figs is trying to do: make scrubs fashionable, a little bit like Lululemon did with the yoga pants. Lululemon made the yoga pants fashionable. Um, so this is this is an interesting story. This is this is a long tradition of clothing where if you succeed at making a new piece of clothing uh, um, profit profitable and, and and popular, you're gonna you're gonna make it make it big. And that, that's the whole idea of Levi's. Like if you look at what happened to to Levi's in in the early day of the, the jeans business, um, that was a similar story. So it's a bet it's a bet on adoption. Um, we'll see how this goes. Doesn't really matter as much right now for an undervalued growth stock video because this stock is trading at a point two, so extremely, extremely, extremely cheap. If I had my full list of stocks, it would be in the bottom. Here I only have the cheapest stocks, so you can see it's 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 well anchored in the in the average cheapest stock out here, uh, and we'll see we'll see if if uh, if they succeed or not at their, at their value proposition. But uh, I mean this this is this is a company that's that's trading under two times sales, right? For a seventy percent growth margin. Very profitable business in my view. Let me move on to the new player, SunPower. So this is the first time I include SunPower in one of these videos. Because you know, you know, I'm very bullish on Enphase on this channel, but Enphase is still a little expensive. Now, a stock that I find very cheap is SunPower. SunPower is trading at under one-time sales. Under one-time sales. So it's, it's very uh, cheap. For a stock that's still expected to grow at 20%. The gross margin is very low because SunPower is a fully integrated installer. So they do everything. They install their own systems. Uh, they do it all. It's their own panels. Um, they do it all. And, and and the stock is very, very cheap right now because, because people see the interest rates and they think, oh, nobody's going to get solar anymore again. Um, which is which is which is a uh, silly. It's a mega trend. Solar solar is a is a is a mega trend. Uh, solar has been announced dead multiple times. Uh, if you've been following the space over the pa past fifteen years, um, but the point here, the reason why I put solar sun power power is there is because sun power uses micro inverters from Enphase. Uh, so it is a sun power is actually a, a co-opetitor to Enphase. They they have everything different than Enphase. Except from a, from for the micro inverter, so they use that micro inverter technology, which I much prefer over the string inverter. So that's why I put in, in Sun Power in there. Dirt cheap, very very cheap. Mercado Libre. What can I say about Mercado Libre? It is it, it it's it's still I still don't understand how this stock is not near two thousand bucks a share. It's it's still trading under twelve hundred dollars, even though everything's doing well. It's growing very fast. It's navigating uh, the, the, the landscape. Uh, you know, all, all of the slowdown in Latin America, it navigated it perfectly. Uh, their, their fintech division is growing, right? They're, they're managing Argentina just fine. Even though there's tremendous inflation in Argentina, they are still growing way faster than inflation. Um, you know, they are succeeding where others are failed. Like, for example, in Brazil, they, they succeed and, and see limited fail. And this stock is, 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 a uh, is dirt cheap. That's all I have to say. Mercado Libre is, a uh, is kind of an Amazon or the Alibaba. Of Latin America is the way I would I would call it. Uh, then what about Airbnb? Airbnb is still dirt cheap. Um, uh, people, for some reason, this stock is is absolutely not popular or not popular on YouTube. I don't I, I don't know if it's popular or, uh, even on Twitter. I don't see it discussed much. Um, you you know you have a very uh, large real estate investing community on Twitter, um, and so so a lot of people actually criticize Airbnb and and they take these edge cases and they try to criticize Airbnb. From the end point of an edge case, um, but that's 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 not the story for Airbnb. Airbnb is monetizing trust. That's what this business does. Uh, you know, it's allowing you to to rent a space to someone you don't know, uh, and you have their rating, and you have their Airbnb insurance, and you you just have trust uh, that you can do it right. What Uber did for getting into your neighbor's car so that they take it to the airport. What Uber did for that, Airbnb is doing 
to the housing uh, space. It's a much bigger story than just hotels. We're disrupting hotels, of course, but they're going to disrupt much more than hotels, in my view. They will disrupt mom and pop rentals because uh, mom and pop are going to prefer renting to someone who has a profile on Airbnb and who has 50 or 75 verified ratings from prior people who rented to them. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a more efficient process. And this company is a platform over or on the top of it all. And, uh, and I enjoy Airbnb very much. I think, I think it's a, I also think it's a low cost leader in its space. It's actually much cheaper to go through Airbnb oftentimes than to go through hotels. Um, so the stock is dirt cheap. That's all I have to say about Airbnb. Uh, I don't understand why it's, uh, why it's so, so cheap. Uh, but it is cheap compared to the future growth. Let's moving on to the last two, which are kind of a little expensive for this spreadsheet, but in my other spreadsheet, they would look cheap. Uh, so we, we have Zscaler. So Zscaler is the only SaaS company out here uh, that made it, that made it to the spreadsheets. What is, so what is Zscaler? Zscaler is the inventor of zero trust security. What is zero trust security? That is the software that allows, say, a company, imagine a company and you have 10,000 laptops. If one laptop gets infected by, by, by a virus, um, how do you make it so that that laptop does not infect the entire computer network of the business? That's where Zscaler comes in. Zscaler makes sure that there is no unsecured connections between any endpoint devices like a laptop or a phone. No unsecured connections. They are the pioneer in a, in a, in zero trust. And as a result of that, their growth is still very impressive. And it is a product that companies very, 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 very much need. Uh, um, you know, you need zero trust and you need, you need an endpoint, uh, security software, which will be CrowdStrike. But CrowdStrike is more expensive than Zscaler. Um, you know, Zscaler has, has come under attack by Cloudflare for like, Two or three years, Cloudflare saying, oh, we can do better than Zscaler at zero trust. Um, but it's not showing in the cells, right? In the cells, Zscaler is still, is still the, the, the absolute leader in their space. And I will, and it's very cheap. And I will finish with an equally cheap stock, a stock that, that's gotten cheaper recently because it went down. It's Geolingo. Go figure. I don't know what to say, but Geolingo is cheap right now. Uh, uh, it's, it's only trading at 10 times sales, but that's not the point. If you look, if you adjust that for growth and if you adjust that for gross, gross profit, you get into a very interesting value proposition at less than a 0 0.38 for a sector, which I guarantee most portfolios don't have. This Duolingo is as uncorrelated of an asset as it gets because it's, it's, it's language lessons. That's what Geolingo is. It's language lessons on your phone. Um, the, the story of the stock, you know, they are trying to make it much bigger because they're launching Geolingo Math. They have a popular English testing system, the Geolingo English Test. They have a lot of good things going for it, but but it's the gamification of education. And um, and I only I only see uh, a company like Geolingo get, getting getting bigger and bigger. Um, as they extend more products, add more languages, and 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 as people, um, you know, the interest in learning a foreign language is a, is a is a very very old, very very old ancient interest, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. People are always going to want uh, to learn other languages, and uh, it's a free way to do it. It's a free way to do it. They they are also launching a subscription service. They are Duolingo uh, subscriptions uh, because. Um, um, uh, advertising revenue is a little down right now still. So this is a company that you can explain would drop also partially with the decline in uh, in revenue, the decline in uh, in revenue from advertising. Anyways, these are my 13 undervalued stocks. I hope you appreciated this video. Thank you so much for watching it. Have a wonderful day. This is not investment advice, and I appreciate your likes, and I appreciate your subscribes. Have a great day.